so welcome to my presentation. Um, <clears throat> so what we're going to talk about today uh, is actually a research that, I mean, the main point about it is to show how to start from, from scratch, and then get to the point where you have uh, vulnerability and uh, if there's something I really emphasize on taking from this presentation is the actual process of, of doing the research. So our agenda for today, uh, first I'll briefly uh, cover sandbox concepts, what is sandbox usages and why we need that. Uh, then I'll go to some more specific Apple uh, use cases, but still I'll uh, talk about high level um, things. Then I'll go through the entire path that got me to find this um, and iOS vulnerability. And I'll also talk about a technique I used to, not to debug the kernel, but to make sure it's easier to, to trace that. And finally, I'll show uh, some lazy did, uh, thing I did to debug Apple processes. Um, but before we start with the presentation, uh, this again, it's about myself. My name is Adam Donenfeld. I've been a security researcher for the last couple of years. I focus mainly on mobile platforms, but I also have a little bit of experience with PC. Uh, my research is mainly uh, vulnerability assessment and exploitation. Right now I work at Zimperium uh, as an iOS researcher, and I also like to present my uh, I work in uh, conferences, um, and I also live now in Europe. I moved uh, from Israel to Amsterdam. Uh, so, sandbox. Uh, so, operating system wants to protect sensitive attack surfaces, and it does that using sandboxing. That's something that uh, the tendency to actually use sandbox to make the attack surface smaller is something that we've seen in iOS. I mean, everyone does that, but iOS, the Apple started doing that in the last five years more than, more than ever. Uh, because Apple realized that instead of trying to fix certain bugs, it's just much, much better. I mean, it's much uh, more practical to actually just close attack surfaces. We also see, I mean, like in, uh, we also saw that example in Windows, in Win32K, but Apple has been doing that for a lot of uh, different mechanisms. Now, Putting aside knowing the attack surface, Sandbox is also pretty useful if you want to prevent uh, apps from accessing specific information. For instance, uh, our flashlight application is not supposed to be able to read our fingerprints. Uh, and Core of D, for instance, which is responsible for uh, some uh, authentication and security things on the device, is not supposed to be able to access our calendar or our camera. Um, <clears throat> so uh, that's that's the, you know, the known use case for Sandbox. But as we can see, Apple actually introduced new Sandbox rules because of uh, vulnerabilities. A famous case was in 2015 when Mark Dowd, I think, I think about that was the guy, he found an attack from AirDrop, from, I think it was a, a directory traversal, which just got, uh, root got, got you root access on the device because sharing D, which is the daemon AirDrop uh, uses, uh, was running, if I remember correctly, as root without sandbox. So just Apple just put it into a sandbox, and I, even if you have an AirDrop vulnerability, you'll still need another one to make sure you can elevate your privileges. And we also saw that uh, recently. I mean, for the for those of you who used to jailbreak your phones uh, seven, eight years ago, uh, all of the symlinks uh, restrictions that now. We have on AFC, that's why we don't have, see a lot of USB uh, vulnerabilities uh, like before. And if some of you remember my research from last year, uh, I presented the fully working kernel exploits in like 99% success rate, working pretty much instantly, but still it needed the sandbox escape. So even if you have a kernel exploit, if you have something that prevents you from accessing this certain attack surface, then, then you still have a lot of work to do. Um, so actually, sandbox and mapping in is much better than closing specific bugs. Or at least cost effective wise, it's much, I mean, as an attacker, I would like to have bugs fixed and not attack surfaces being closed. Um, but sometimes an app does need some specific permissions, elevated permissions, um, like 
sometimes, I mean, Instagram wants to be able to use your camera. So Apple doesn't want to give you direct access to the camera driver, but it still wants uh, Instagram to be able to use the camera. So technically speaking, if an app wants to utilize the camera, um, not request an RPC to use the camera, but literally ask the, the device to use the camera, it will just ask, I mean, okay, the different example here, uh, video decoding. If you want to uh, encode a video, you have to talk with the video encoding driver if you want to do it uh, in a hardware accelerated way. And that, that's how an app would normally do that. But on iOS, we have media server, which is a broker on, in that case, because if I'm an app, if I'm a, a video app, I'm not going to talk with AV video encoder, but rather I'll speak with, I will ask the uh, media server to do that encoding for me. And then media server will reply back uh, with the encoded video. Now what media server does here is making sure I'm not trying to, um, to pound the kernel and make sure that I do what Apple wants me to do. So um, even if I somehow have a vulnerability in AV video encoder, like Ziva, I'm still not good. I mean, I mean, I'm still not good to go from uh, an unprivileged app because only media server can speak, can yeah, communicate with AV video encoder. So, <clears throat> with that said, like every good presentation uh, in iOS vulnerabilities, I'll surface. Um, so I'm not going to talk about iOS surface too much here because, uh, oh wait, um, because it's not relevant to the. Um, it's not entirely relevant to representation. So in a single sentence, iOS, uh, iOS surface is an object in iOS. So if I'm process A and I want to send a lot of information to process B, instead of sending it five gigabytes, I can just map it in process B. And all the process B has to know is a certain ID. So it makes everything much more faster. And it's mainly used uh, for, tra for transferring a frame buffer uh, information and graphic stuff. So our surface cannot only map uh, information, but it also have a certain set of properties. Literally a dictionary key value based properties. But if I want to create an surface object and I want to put some properties, then the kernel does verify that I'm not trying to put some uh, weird values in them. So one year ago, I found a vulnerability in our surface, uh, which um, actually I never saw a talk about it. So there is one of the properties that we have in our surface is something called a plane. It has a size, a base, and it has a lot of them. So there was a problem here. Um, that's the plane. I'm controlling plane size and plane base. And I, there are a lot of different planes. So here it takes uh, the plane base I'm giving it. It takes the plane size. It uh, combines them uh, together. And then it checks if the last plane base we had overlaps with the new one. What I didn't uh, think about here, uh, the guys at Cupertino, is that uh, this is a sign. Uh, it's, it, it, if I'm putting a negative value, it, it will just treat it like an unsigned int. Um, and this way, I can make a um, buffer overflow here. So what it lets me do is putting a very big plane size, because I can put a negative plane base. And then I can um, override. Then I can go and, I mean, put a very a, a big size here, which is something Apple obviously doesn't want us to have. <clears throat> so, um, unfortunately, from an attacker's perspective, even though the, even though that looks like a powerful vulnerability, uh, iOS Surface only saves the planes as a value, as a property. So even if we have a big plane size number here, it's still not good enough to actually pwn something directly from the iOS Surface kernel driver. We have to get something else to use that property and make sure that, for example, user mode, the daemon or another kernel driver uses that value without, because other, other parties in the kernel and drivers assume that these properties are sanitized. Um, so basically what we want to know is what uses our surface. And obviously we want to go straight to the kernel. So instead of looking for user mode processes, I will start uh, looking uh, um, for kernel drivers that use um, IO Surface. So the way we do that is IO Surface is an object which we create using the IO Surface root user client. 
so if I'm a user, if I'm a process, I'm just creating a handle to this specific um, interface exposed by the ISO Surface Kernel driver. Uh, if you want to see, if you want to uh, obtain a handle to an ISO Surface object, like I said before, each ISO Surface object has an ID. So drivers do that uh, we're using the IO Surface Roots uh, service. It's a kernel service, and as a user mode process, we cannot, um, not directly, we cannot uh, talk, uh, use that, but other drivers can. Uh, now, the way drivers sp uh, use other services in the system uh, is literally by their name. So IO Surface Root register it, registers itself as IO Core Surface Root. So, which means that if a driver uses IO surface, this string will be in the driver. So in the most narrow and simplest uh, way, I was just starting to look for the string IO core surface root uh, in the kernel cache, which yielded a list of uh, kernel drivers that uh, uses the uses IO surface. Now, uh, like I said before, most of these are, uh, not most, but like um, the camera interface is, clo is uh, closed from a sandbox. We use media server to communicate with that driver. Um, some, other are, some of them are not accessible from the sandbox, some aren't, um, but that's the list of drivers that actually utilize IO surface. So our vulnerability was about the property plane in the IO surface um, uh, object. And because most, if not, I think all of the drivers we have here are actually closed source. So again, going the most uh, dumbest approach, I was just looking for the string plane in all of these drivers. And then a debug string appeared, and a very interesting debug string uh, actually. Uh, PI surface dest get plane blah, 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 blah. And we see that they use planes here and IO surface objects. Again, I don't really, ha I mean, from, um, from the first view, it's, it doesn't really mean a lot, but it's a good direction in, because the other ones didn't have anything to do with planes, uh, to, at least for, in terms of strings. So going to the, to the place where we, I had uh, that string, uh, string, I saw the following code. Um, I hope it's readable. So um, I assumed, okay, so in, in uh, the drivers in X and U, they have V tables. So if I want to check whether an object uses um, a specific, calls a specific function, that's a V table offset, and that's where it calls the function. So what I assumed because of that string is that X8 here is an IO surface object, and when I took offset 110 in the IO surface V table, I saw that this was indeed the, the get plane size. And they actually use the, 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 the parameters that the, this function ex expects is just a single one, which is the plane ID. So X0 is the IO surface itself because it's a virtual call, and W1 is the uh, plane ID. Now again, this is just an assumption, but it's a very good one, in my opinion, because uh, we, ba we saw like actual debug strings, and because the, uh, the probability that this offset will match the, the actual string is, um, is not so high. So if it does match, it's a good sign. Now, if you guys remember, the vulnerability was a controllable plane size, and we see that we have a memset with, our control, with, a, with a plane size with 80s, which we don't know yet what the 80s are. And to be honest, I still don't know what the 80s are till today. Uh, and we override something, I'm not sure what yet. But this looks like a very good start because um, uh, we can control, we can call memset in the kernel with an arbitrary length. Um, so yeah, so like I said, uh, we get the plane size, it puts it in x23. x23 is the length parameter, which is being called to memset. Uh, I removed the, the assembly code above it, but it was just a duplication of this one. So this memset, calls the same function, but put here zero. So it was zero here, but it's the same, uh, it's the same thing. So, okay, uh, recapping, recapping here, uh, we have uh, an override with 80s with an arbitrary length, sounds interesting. Uh, but to actually do something with that, we have to actually understand what uh, Apple D5500 is. And I'm gonna say D5500 because this is too long to be said so many times in the presentation. So, 
D5500 is a video decoding driver, um, a, video, uh, a hardware accelerated video decoding, which is unfortunately uh, not accessible from the sandbox, uh, but we'll see an interesting approach soon. And to communicate with that driver, we have to use, like I said before, a media server D. So if I'm in app and I want to have a decoded video, I'm sending a decode my video please request to media server D. Uh, which uh, checks that I'm not trying to mess with anything because this driver is extremely, I mean, it's like a, like a glass. <laughs> I mean, you, 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 I don't know. It was like, I mean, if you have actual access to this driver, at least if you had, it wasn't that complicated to get it to crash. And if you guys ever took a look at media server D, the same thing. Some of the reg legitimate APIs crash media server D. So media server was making sure we're not trying to do anything, uh, anything uh, bad here. Then it forwarded the request to D5500. D5500 sent the decoded video back to media server D, which sent it back to us. So uh, a very unfortunate thing happened while I was doing this research. Uh, Apple silently closed uh, this vulnerability. That was the only two assembly uh, letters. That, that, was, that was everything they needed to actually fix the vulnerability. And I'm not sure who found that or who reported that, but I never saw any credits on the on the uh, security advisory. Um, but I was still very curious about what I saw because the mem set with 80s is something I don't understand. And surfaces are always uh, fun when it comes to iOS. So I kept with the uh, with my you know, with my thoughts about uh, D5500. So I wanted to know how we get to this function because I was just looking up a string, so I wasn't exactly sure how I'm going to get um, execution uh, here. Because just in the middle of the driver, and the driver is not uh, open sourced and not documented at all. In fact, if, I, if you Google that, the only things you see are crash dumps. We just mentioned that as a loaded extension. Um, so looking up XRefs um, to this uh, function, <laughs> First of all, there were like billions of them. And again, no sources, so go figure out what it means. Uh, some of them were actually virtual, so we don't really have an XREF. You have to either write your own tools to help you with virtual calls or just guess. And again, how can you actually make sure that this function is eventually reached? Because if you have so many functions, I mean, how can you know that? And, in, and I knew that this is going to happen a lot. The, Okay, I have a function, does it get reached? And for that, I have had an interesting approach. I took the Yaru project, um, thanks for uh, Luca Tudesco and Marco Grassi for that, by the way. And they have uh, a remap page uh, macro. They had, I mean, it's not, today it doesn't work anymore as far as, far as far as I know, which was disabling KPP for a certain page. So what I did, I just used, I just disabled the KPP for a specific page. And then I overwrote full instruction on the address I was uh, trying to trace. So ultimately, my goal was to give a specific uh, kernel address uh, in my project. And whenever this address was executed, I wanted to be notified about it. And I wanted to see all of the registers in that certain moment. So what I did, I called it yellow plus plus. Let's say that I wanted to trace the execution uh, context in, in address 118. I first called Rima page on the uh, entire page. Then I allocated the shellcode, which just uh, pushed all of the registers to the stack, called kprintf, had some false tabs here, and then just returned back. Then what I did, I overwrote uh, the code here in 118 so that it will actually jump to my shell code instead of executing uh, that specific um, instruction. And the overwrite, like I said before, was with uh, LDR x16, loading eight bytes um, uh, up front, then calling the address, uh, and then calling the uh, jumping to that specific uh, shell code address. And then what I also did was overwriting the full instruction I overwrote here, I put them here. Uh, so then the execution will seamlessly go back to the, um, to where it was. Uh, I also changed the red address here, but I didn't like put it in the, uh, the square, but there is also 
some uh, uh, modifications to X30. So it goes back to, you know, to the appropriate address and not to 11C. And um, this way, every time 118 was executed, I was notified mm -hmm. about it. And um, I was actually surprised because it was it worked better than I expected. And it's, it was extremely powerful when, for me, at least for me, when I uh, was working on uh, kernel drivers, closed source ones at least. Um, so around the, around the uh, place where I saw the string with the memset, I saw the same behavior again, same approach, some length. I'm not sure exactly what it did, but again, I can assume it might somehow be related to our surface. And again, this 80 with memsets on something, I'm not sure what it was. Um, and okay, I understood at this point, I can start reversing like a decent person, the driver. And for that, I, um, because I had the kernel tracing technique. So, uh, I'm not going to go, uh, deeply in that, but, um, basically you have to, I mean, there are some, uh, key rules when, when you start uh, reversing a driver. First of all, you have to know where the V tables are and where they point to. And if you can automate that, that will be fantastic. Uh, you have to know the entry points to the driver, all of the, and in Linux, it's IOCTELs, in iOS, it, and in ISNU, it's external methods most of the times. And again, I highly recommend automating that. It is possible to do that manually, but it's, it's really not fun. And I mean, a lot of people claimed to have, uh, to release tools about it. Uh, I think Sigusa did actually release something about it, but I honestly didn't take a look yet. Um, but Ida Python works well on that. And I, and I think writing something that's on the way while you start reversing something is actually a very good approach. Um, okay, so like we said before, uh, 80, the memset 80 was, had something to do with IO surface in the driver, so let's examine the IO surface usages in the driver. So like before, <laughs> simple uh, string search for IO surface in the specific driver and allocate kernel memory, ta -ta 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 -ta, look up surface failed, which is perfect because that's where they look up the IO surface objects. Now I put this code in, um, took a snippet uh, in C because um, because it was too long for the, uh, if it would be in assembly. Now, what I did here is I assumed V24 is an IO surface object. So while all of that can be, might be false, I did notice um, some very uh, unique, pa uh, unique pattern for usage of IO surface objects, and that is, like I said before, with IO surface, you can map, inform, map uh, memory from process A to process B. And the way Apple do that is using something called IO memory descriptor. So I saw that there was a function, a vtable function in IO surface, which created an IO, an IO memory descriptor um, object. Again, this was just an, um, a guess, but I saw that offset wise, it was calling the same API that you would call when you actually use uh, well, in a proper use of IO surface. So IO memory descriptor map, which returns us an object called IO memory map. It's not really relevant here, but the thing is, it does look like an IO surface pattern. It was, it's a lot of guessing and you, are, you cannot be certain for 100%, but it does look like, in terms of the offsets, it looks like an IO surface usage. Um, so, and that's, that's the thing, I mean, that's the interesting part here. Even if, even if you're not sure about it, just guessing might be a good start. Now, um, okay, the offsets I saw here in this uh, struct I called surface props, um, somehow match the same offsets I saw in memset. Again, allegations, uh, but it looked like the same thing. So then I just used the kernel tracing technique I showed you before, and I saw that, um, this was indeed an IO surface object. And that, uh, yeah, I mean, in that memset, mem I, I didn't get to the memset yet, but this was for sure an IO surface object because I was just tracing the, the address of the V table and it matched, match, matched the one um, that IO surface had. So I knew that for, for sure that this is an IO surface object here. Uh, now, the thing is, obviously, because our vulnerability was with the plane size, we want to be able to supply our own IO surface object. That's, that's the thing. 
So for that, I had to reverse the actual call for media server because, like I said, it's not all accessible from the sandbox. But because this API uh, gets a lot of user mode objects, a lot of complicated ones, I assume maybe we can somehow affect the, if not the actual IO surface object, maybe its properties. So I know that media server is the one that uh, calls the 5500, mainly because it always crashes when you when you call it when you use it, um, and. When you when I searched up the string D5500, I actually didn't see any media server, and the closest pro, the, the closest thing was um, something called Video Toolbox, which I saw first time when I started this research, because it had some video decoding uh, related functions. Um, so yeah, we have to reverse Video Toolbox. Now this is really painful because it's in something called Dialy Shell Cache, which is um, so in iOS, you don't actually have libraries. You have a big file called Dali Chart Cache, which is like, I think, more than a gigabytes now. Uh, now, IDA 7 claimed to support it. I beg to differ. It's, uh, it's a very bad uh, implementation. I'm not sure who's to blame, but even on IDA 7, it wasn't that good. But before that, they didn't even claim to support it. So I was actually working on, a, on an IDA Python script to, because if you put it in IDA Python, you just don't have branches for most of the functions. So I created an IDA Python script that made sure that we have those branches. And two days later, they released IDA 7. <laughs> so I just I worked like at least a full day on that script, maybe even two days. And then I didn't even have to use it. But shit happens. So uh, no apparent usage of uh, D5500 in Video tool Toolbox as well. So uh, at this point, I was a little bit lost because like, you cannot debug media server D or this extension uh, while it runs on media server D. So I guess maybe there is another framework involved. And I was just looking up the uh, string D5500 in the entire uh, Dali chart cache, which took like two days to load in IDA. And then I found that there was um, an interesting unknown uh, framework called H264H8. Um, which actually did a proper usage of the APIs to talk with the driver. So I did see that in a function called Apple D5500 decode frame internal, there was this API, which is the API um, Apple supplies if you want to use exposed uh, interface of drivers. So every time you call that function, you actually send a request, a request to a driver. So, um, the actual uh, exported function in H264H8 was uh, this one, this long function name. But unfortunately, it didn't have any xrefs. And I mean, most of the code, I'm saying most because sometimes it does happen, but most of the code isn't written not to be used. Um, so I thought it might be uh, maybe in a V table or something. And because Ida and uh, Dali Chert Cash aren't, so, aren't good friends yet. Uh, maybe he just didn't parse it. So then I was like, okay, I'll just search the address in IDA and see if I find something interesting. And uh, yeah, I found it in the V table, um, in something that looks like a V table, which also didn't have an XREF. And then I started going with the same technique of, okay, if it doesn't have XREF, it's just because IDA doesn't uh, parse it. And then I just started uh, searching for the address again. And I saw that there was a vtable and another vtable-like thing, which was contained in another vtable. So eventually, uh, this one did have symbols. It uh, did, did have xref, sorry. And going uh, up the stack, uh, the stack trace, um, an object, a, a call, uh, which was which is named uh, blah 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 decoder create instance, was actually being called. And if you can see here, specific video formats were given to a function, um, which is not really, I mean, there are, were a lot of functions. I'm not going to go to it, through each one of them, but I still want to show you the hierarchy. So the function H264H8 register, which calls this one, also didn't have xrefs, but it did appear as a string somewhere. Um, so what I realized is that it doesn't, it, it actually uses DL open and DL sim to call that, which I think is weird considering the use of daily chart cache. So again, this is the flow I had to go 
from the moment I, uh, I send the request to media server till a driver was being used. So I'm sending an XPC request to media server. XPC is, by the way, uh, some, API, uh, some IPC mechanism that Apple creates. Basically, you can send uh, information easily in a dictionary or other uh, nice object uh, style. So you do that using an, a documented API called VT, the compression session create, which is getting, I mean, you actually call that in, um, in your uh, process, and as far as I remember, that's the actual same uh, function which is being called in media server. And there's like a check, if you're a media server, then do something, otherwise just send stuff to media server. So this function calls the open DLC, which calls um, age, uh, 264 register, which calls this function, which creates an object with a V table, which is another V table, which is another function. So this wasn't fun at all to reverse, but we have to do that. So, um, I mean, the main problem was lit seriously either, uh, not even because, you know, it's just extra with string search, but it was super slow. Uh, so this, um, API, I mean, all the VT, the compression, blah, 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 wildcard things are actually documented in the sense that you know what the parameters they are expecting. And I figured out perhaps this is, I mean, that sounds like something that is related to our surface because it's actually decoding uh, frames. So maybe that, that's the thing that, um, that's the thing. I mean, no, none of the APIs actually talk about an IO surface ID being given to an API, but it must be there though somewhere. So <clears throat> this function, uh, I mean, this function was calling this function within the H264 Edge 8 framework. And then completely undocumented, I saw the following code. A wild dictionary appears, then you can, you could supply, I mean, I just reversed the entire chain, chain I showed you. And then I saw that if you supply the dictionary, I mean, the, the API can receive a dictionary. And if you supply this dictionary, it gets some parameters. This is completely undocumented, and it's accessible from the sandbox. And I mean, if there's a good, uh, in my experience, if there is a nice surface, there is a bug. So <laughs> I mean, at the moment I saw that, I was like, OK, uh, finally something uh, good go, go, um, is going here. And I obviously, obviously had no idea what offset x and offset y were, or what last style was. I did know that Canvas Surface ID sounds like the actual Surface ID we uh, give to the driver. Um, so yeah, like I said, it optionally receives an IO Surface ID. Uh, it also receives some offsets. And I wanted to check whether this was the, surf the surface we saw uh, in the kernel. And using the kernel, the iOS kernel tracing technique, I did. And it was indeed uh, the specific IO Surface uh, object we uh, specified. This is another example how this was useful because without having that, I cannot think on, 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 a, on, a, on a way to actually um, make sure that this was our iOS surface object. So I understood that what I supplied here was going directly to, to the kernel and it was accessible from the sandbox because media server D just used it and passed forward the request to the driver. So our objective was to get to the uh, memset. As I hope you remember. And I mean, at that point, we already had control on the IO surface we supplied. So I just used the IO, iOS hill and tracing technique on the memset area. Now, um, this is the memset. And this is a tile offset X, tile offset Y are, um, are what is what we supplied in this dictionary. And if you see here, an interesting thing, Tile offset Y and tile offset uh, X are being given here. And these are all IO surface properties we fully control, or at least in a very good, I mean, yeah. I mean, it depends on other properties sometimes, but in that case, I don't think there was any restriction, if I remember correctly. And this was given to plane offset one here, which is being used here as the length. Now, not only we control the length, we can also control the offset from where we start uh, overriding. So this is much more powerful because, um, I mean, overriding a lot of uh, things is one thing. Making sure where you actually start overriding is extremely powerful because if you can actually utilize this memset, 
And you can write this AT on a specific length uh, a field on, on an, of a different object. So, I mean, this is good enough to start working your way into a very powerful read-write uh, primitive on the kernel. So, I mean, once you have the offset controlled as well, this is a completely different game. So, there was one problem though. I mean, and if I put the kernel uh, techni uh, tracing technique here, I saw that these were uh, indeed my, uh, my properties, but context, some unknown data, unknown. Um, I mean, this, the, this uh, expression was, uh, was always preventing the code flow from going into the memset. Now again, you are 20 something functions uh, deep in the driver. I mean, how do you find out what this is? So, because there's no source code, there are no extras because it's a struct offset. So how to find out what it is? So um, I looked at the assembly and that was ultimately the check. They took something for offset 448 and then they took the sixth uh, byte from it and they end at it with x30. Um, I have absolutely, I mean, I had absolutely no idea what it was. And then I did the, again, most dumbest approach. I just dumped the entire driver's text section and started grabbing. So, um, yeah, it's sim I mean, nothing, uh, no magics. It was just dumping the kernel, and literally grabbing the offsets with STR. And fortunately here, there was a good candidate. Um, I mean, that was the only store into offset uh, 448. So I went to this address. And I, I mean, if it's the only one, then we can assume, we can say, actually safely assume that this was the object, object we were looking at. But here, we had x28. Now, I'm not sure um, how, how much uh, pain you had from reversing drivers in iOS, but x28 is, the, uh, is a function of the OS object. So every time you release a refcount on an object, they use the offset x28. Yeah, I think, yeah, x28, and x20 is uh, retained. So you cannot grab X28 on a kernel driver. You have hundreds of matches. And at this point, I unfortunately had to start reversing like 15 functions. And again, you cannot have the compiler. Ser you seriously have to go uh, through the offsets and hope that eventually you find something useful. So again, I think this, I mean, this was really, I mean, I was a little bit miserable at that time, but again, I was on the other hand, really curious to get to that mem set. So, um, and eventually I got to that point, so I saw what they put uh, in the x28. I mean, as I said here, we have to x28, from, from, uh, which is being given to 448. So as I said, it was the six byte, and I saw that there was some calculation, which I'll uh, translate it for you. That was the arithmetic that was done and being put in that specific uh, thing. Now, again, it's the middle of nowhere. We have no idea what we're looking at. Uh, but again, 1B0 is a little bit less common. So I did the same approach. I just grabbed 1B0 with STR, which yielded the, uh, yeah, following uh, offset, which yielded the following interesting, interesting string. Blah, 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 blah. Edge 264, FW, set PPS and SPS. No idea what it is yet. Now, there's something you didn't know about me. I never liked H264, and I never knew anything about H264, except that that's what I download when I want to see movies. <laughs> and um, again, for looking on the check, I literally Googled the, I mean, uh, I just looked around the, the, the function, and, and I saw another interesting string, ABC decoder, power setter, unsupported, nalu, length size. So I googled APC Nalu, and the first result was, welcome to H264. <laughs> no, thank you. And we, I mean, at that point, I, I understood that having the standard might be useful. Um, I would try to be, to be honest, I would refrain from, I mean, I would try to do anything. Uh, I mean, reading the standard is seriously the last thing you wanna do, but it was very useful eventually, and you'll see, you'll see soon why. So I'll summarize it for you. A video is actually, is actually a bunch of null units, hence nalu. So just a bunch of null units. So you can actually, each, everything you see in a, in a video file is a, a null object. And I'm not sure if you can see anything from here. 
So I'll try to zoom because there are a few fields which are important. So there is a lot of things in, in null objects. And to be honest, I'm not really sure what they all mean because, I mean, people do a PhD on that, I guess. <laughs> and uh, but there uh, um, some uh, header uh, offsets in this specific object, which are very important here, are the forbidden zero bit, which is, I have no idea why they put that, but that's a standard. So yeah, we always we have to comply. Null ref IDC, which I'm still, I mean, it wasn't relevant to the research, and I didn't have to understand what it was. I mean, assume it, I assume it's a reference, but I'm, I cannot uh, give a guarantee on that. But null unit type is something very interesting because this defines how we process the null object. So, I mean, we had a lot of things here, but after them, after them, every, everything that happened was based on this uh, null unit type. So again, each null object has a type, and I mean, now that we know that, and we know that we are talking about null, ob null objects uh, in the kernel, how do we find where the kernel um, processes the, the specific object based, based on its type? So I got into um, that uh, specific code, and I saw zero null ref IDC with IDR, see, and this um, label, which is being called here. Now we see that there is a branch not zero, and the um, and I mean if this is if it this is zero and this is five, this string is being printed. Now, going back to the manual, we did see that null ref IDC, and we did see unit type. So it might be uh, I mean. I was confident enough to assume that they might come after each other in the struct in the kernel. Um, and as you can see, they just um, pop them from the object uh, cons uh, consecutively, I mean, in the same order. So, and I saw the, the word IDR, which is, I don't know what. So again, I just Googled, I mean, I just uh, looked for the string IDR in the manual. And that's why sometimes manual are important, but really vicious. And I found out that number five in null unit type is something called IDR. And as we saw here, eight, as we saw here, there was a comparison to five. So now we know that not only this is uh, a null object, we actually know some very important offsets in that object. And at that point, it was uh, much easier to go and see the actual processing of the object. And then what I saw, I mean, and there, I mean, there are a lot of uh, null types. I'm gonna go through the important ones for this specific research, but there are billions of them. And I would be surprised if there are other vulnerabilities there unless Apple uh, revamped the entire driver. So the first one that we, have to, the, the, that we have to know about is something called SPS. So if we have a driver, if you have a video, so there are a bunch of properties for a short uh, video, um, uh, video uh, sequence. So just like a few seconds, it, it, it depends. It can be a few seconds, it can be, it can actually be, actually be the entire movie, but just a bunch of properties for a specific duration. PPS, picture parameter set, is the same thing like SPS, but for pictures. So a bunch of, uh, a bunch of pictures had uh, PPS, uh, like properties like PPS. And there was also something called IDR, which is seriously like a BMP. It was a standalone image. So for those of you who are a little bit more familiar with video, uh, the comp video encoding, the, you do, I mean, it, you have like a picture and then you have uh, only the, um, the modifications between each frame and that's what uh, is stored in the file. So IDR was a complete standalone image. So you couldn't go, I mean, it didn't need any other frame to be parsed and other frames were based on the, last, on the IDR they had before them. So for each SPS, so for each short video, um, <coughs> sorry, for each uh, short uh, video uh, sequence, the IDR null was the first one. So this is how it looks in the video. You have the SPS object, the PPS object points to the SPS, and then we have an IDR object, and afterward we have the, we have the frames. So, so this must always be the first one, and this must always point to SPS. By, by ID, by the, by the way. Um, each, I mean, they have a specific ID and they just point to each other. Uh, 
Going back to the research, we had um, the string set PPS and SPS, and then I figured maybe 1B0 is actually an SPS object or a PPS object. Um, so what I did, I seriously sent a video uh, to be decoded, and then I checked using the tracing technique if it was uh, what uh, 1B0 was, and it indeed looked like the SPS I was sending uh, in the video. Now, uh, a note about it, uh, I started using FFmpeg because I was too lazy to, you know, actually go and pulse videos on my own. But then I found out that sometimes all these public tools are not enough. So it was, I mean, it sounds harder than it actually is. There are a lot of uh, actually good parsers in GitHub for uh, H.264 videos. So I just took some, uh, I mean, I just wrote my own tools to decode and to create and to pulse videos. And I know it's a lot of infrastructure work sometimes. But eventually it worked it, at least in my opinion, because this saved me a lot of time in, you know, open uh, 101 editor and starts writing bits. Uh, so like I said, 1B0 was our SPS object, which was sufficient to understand the mysterious memset expression that we didn't have back then, if you remember. So if an object, if an, a property called chromoformat IDC is zero, we can get to the memset. Um, so what I did, and by the way, this means, I mean, if this is zero, it means that the video is monochromatic, so uh, only black and white. Uh, so it controls the, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, because again, it's a standard, <laughs> so uh, it, it, it controls the colors for the video. So what I did, I was just using uh, the tools I wrote, I created a video with chroma format IDC zero, and I tried to decode it. So the way you do that with the API, we call the very long function name CM video format description create form H264 parameter sets from now on H, uh, form H264 parameter sets because I'm not going to say that every time. This initializes the session with the um, with media server and it receives PPS and SPS properties. The session is uh, the, sh the session needs the output from this function, the session creation API. And then we call uh, VT the compression session decodes frame and then Nothing happens. Now, you know, I'm not sure if how it looks now, but I was, you know, imagine you work like two weeks just to get to a specific instruction, and then you're like, okay, I'm finally, I'm finally getting there, and no, nothing happened. I was very, very um, frustrated at that moment. So, I, I mean, I saw that we didn't even get to the point where the driver was being used, and then. I reversed uh, media server D, and I saw that media server checks if chroma format IDC uh, is not zero. And if it's zero, it denies the request. Now, at this point, I'm like, you know, after all the reverse engineering and the tools and everything, but then in a rainy day, I uh, know it needs really never rained, and I was still in Israel back then, so in a sunny day, yet depressing one, I read the H264 format, which revealed the following. So each frame, pointed to a, P, uh, to a PPS object. And every PPS object, I mean, by ID, it's imported by ID. And every, yeah, and every PPS object pointed also by ID to, a, to an SPS object. And like I said, SPS object had the chroma format IDC. Now this got me thinking, why do they need an ID for an SPS object if there is only one? Because if you look at FFmpeg, if you download a video from YouTube and you use FFmpeg to analyze it, there is always one SPP ob S uh, SPS object. Also, when you know when you pause the video, they never have more than one. And of course, I don't I don't want to start writing my own video with bits, so I usually just downloaded the video and parsed it and maybe modified it. But then it got me thinking, maybe there is more than one SPS object. And then um, I read the following. Uh, don't worry, I'll, there, there is a nice uh, infographic later on. Can you, I hope you can see it. I cannot zoom because it's uh, too wide. So, blah, 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 blah. It's most one sequence, uh, um, yeah. Each sequence parameter set, so each SPS is initially considered not active at the start of the operation of the decoding process. At most one SPS is considered active at any given moment during the operation of the decoding process, and the activation of any particular SPS results in the deactivation of the uh, previously active SPS, if any. Which means that standard-wise, I mean, I never saw any video utilizing that 
uh, functionality, but the standard says so, so we have to comply. You could have, theoretically, a lot of SPS objects and a lot of PPS objects, and each PPS object could point to a different SPS object. So there was completely no uh, serious relationship in terms of uh, they can only, each SPS can only be pointed by a single PPS. I mean, you could just point to whatever you want. And in, in, in terms of design, this function was receiving only an S, a single SPS and a single PPS um, uh, object. And because these are uh, pa it's video packets which are being sent asynchronously, this function couldn't get these ones. I mean, I mean, if I was, this function could only get the first SPS that was being used because this could be sent later on after we already started the decoding and this one was checking the Chroma format IDC field. So basically what I could do is, let's say that we send packets to this square and this square decodes the video packets so if I'm sending a frame, and this is currently active, and you know that's the current state of the, the compression of the state machine, this slice could point to PPS2, which points to PPS1, which deactivates, uh, which points to SPS1, which deactivates SPS0. So again, I thought that a lot of, uh, uh, there could be more than a single SPS object, and because this is only called once and only in the beginning, uh, I had the following idea. I'll just create a normal session with media server and I'll send it a nice colorful video. And then I'll just send it an SPS packet with Chroma format IDC equals zero. So like, hey, I have a, I'm a colorful video and all of a sudden a packet which changes the entire video to a monochromatic one. And if you think about it, that's, it doesn't make any sense, but standard wise it's legal. So then I just created the PPS to point to this new SPS. And then I sent a slice which pointed to the SPS, which pointed to the PPS. And then finally I got to the mem set. After two weeks, I found it, I mean, it took me two weeks from the moment I saw the mem set to get to this point, which is, I mean, more frustrating than it sounds, but it was seriously, I mean, it was very anticipated. So uh, again, the, the code flow, I sent a normally looking video. Yeah, that, this is how videos look like if you open them in 101 editor. And then I created a new SPS object and a new PPS object which pointed to the SPS. And then a new IDR, because IDR must be the first uh, slice that is uh, used in the SPS, which pointed to the PPS, to the SPS, and so on. Finally crash, let's go to Apple. And now this was um, around Black Hat last year. And all of a sudden, the most modern operating system in the world, it's always the most operating system in the world, um, went out. And okay, cool. So I looked at the, the betas. I remember it was, uh, I was sick in uh, Vegas and yeah, that's what you do when you're sick uh, from the weather in Vegas. <laughs> and suddenly it doesn't crash anymore. And you saw the way I was going through to get it crashing. And I mean, I was super disappointed that it didn't crash. <laughs> and so I, I, I checked uh, H264, uh, the kernel driver, and I saw that it, there was no apparent change in the driver, which was good because the vulnerability was eventually in the kernel driver and not in the user mode components. But H264, I, I mean, the private framework which had the Canvas Surface ID is changed. The Canvas Surface ID string no longer appears uh, in the framework. And I know it sounds weird that I'm talking about strings in a framework, but seriously, you have no idea what it is to use either on these frameworks. Um, so Apple realized that having this in a dictionary, in an undocumented dictionary, is a very hacky way to uh, treat uh, uh, tile decoded um, videos, uh, tile decoding videos from normal decoding. So they just created, created um, a new API to, for decoding and a new API for tile decoding. If I remember correctly, back then, tile decoding wasn't documented yet, but you could call the API. It was already there. Now, at that point, um, I just, um, if you have kernel rewrite, then you can uh, use debug server to, to actually debug stuff. I mean, you can launch debug server and connect to media server, but it doesn't work. Um, if you do it out of, out of the box. 
And then I went to some uh, old Wikipedia page, which tells you that debug server needed the following, um, um, the following entitlements. It also didn't work. And then I said, maybe I'll just give the same entitlements to media server. And then I tried to launch debug server and attach it to media server. Then it worked. I could debug media server. And the main reason I wanted to debug media server is first of all, I wanted to go to the um, API where it, call, where, where it sent a request to the driver and change the values and see if the crash still happens. And second of all, I want to see what they actually did in the new uh, API there. It was just faster debugging than using uh, IDA uh, the back then. So like I said, they understood that it was a hack. So they added a new bunch of VT tile compression uh, APIs. I used debug server and I changed the values and um, it crashed again. So um, what I understood eventually is that there's just a new API, uh, not a documented one, fortunately. Uh, so here, there is like a 64-bit integer which gets the offset X and offset Y um, that we saw in the dictionary. CVPixel buffer uh, has inside it an IO surface ID. So if you create an, a CVPixel buffer with uh, an IO surface object, so it will just use the same surface uh, ID to the driver. Um, yeah. Uh, so then you could just, instead of using the dictionary, you could just call this API and it would crash instantly. But again, it wasn't documented, so it did take me uh, a while to find it out. So in terms of, um, okay, in terms of uh, disclosure, I found it, I don't know. I mean, there was a gap between uh, iOS betas till, you know, it took me a while to get back to the research. Um, and then I reported it, a month later Apple confirmed it, and in the end of January they deployed it to their uh, devices. I know that it's, it might be a little bit old compared, I mean, we're in the end of August now. Uh, but, I mean, there are some takeaways I really want you guys to take uh, from this uh, presentation. Sometimes, okay, manuals, they suck. We don't like them. They are, un I mean, I could, I mean, I really hate, I, I read quite a few in my life and it was never a fun thing to do. But sometimes they're super useful. Without the manual here, I would never think about creating a new SPS object. So, you know, that's what got me eventually to, to trigger the vulnerability. Uh, infrastructure work. The kernel tracing technique, I mean, without it, I would probably give up at some point because you have no idea how powerful, I mean, you probably have if you ever worked with drivers. It's just insane that you can debug or at least trace a uh, code execution in the device. So it works working even days or weeks on something like that if you can later on debug uh, the kernel. Uh, and like always, iOS is, um, a really good platform, but it still has a way to go. And usually, I mean, you know, the vulnerability itself wasn't extremely complicated, but I think the path there was, I mean, I think it's sometimes more interesting than an actual exploit. I mean, if I compare it to my last, to the presentation I did last year, this was much more complicated. Um, so we have, we have like 35 seconds for Q&A. So uh, thank you, I hope you enjoyed the presentation. I know it wasn't easy. Thank you very much, Adam, for a very interesting talk and also for being the speaker who comes closest to the timeline eloquently. <laughs> that deserves an applause. I still managed. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Uh, perfect timing as well because this breaks us for lunch. We have an hour for lunch and we will see you back here for yeah. lunch. I'm available on Twitter and uh, if you have any questions, you can catch me later and we'll be happy to answer. Yep, uh, any questions as well? You'll also be there at lunchtime, yeah, so yeah, feel free to join us and join you. Thank you. Thank you.